Good afternoon, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1 p.m., beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads, and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary, and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, companies, and a meeting place about the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, offering desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And we're a safe space for artists to take risk in their practice and make time for collaboration. This week's talk is by longtime studio resident Sharon Clark, the creative director of Raucous, a collective of theatre makers, technologists and designers. She'll be talking about how the pandemic has changed how we think of theatre, some of the ideas that Raucous have been testing and how this is going to influence the work they make in the future. There'll be a Q&A at the end and the talk runs at roughly 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into the chat window and I'll pick them out to ask Sharon. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. There'll be a captioned version of this talk available here after the talk is finished. Before we start, next week's talk is by Alice Quigley, the editor-in-chief of Container Magazine, a new online magazine about creative technology. She'll talk about her approach to tech, about raising up different voices that question, dissent and explore, and about supporting communities of action and resistance through writing and content. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, give this video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share this link now on any of your socials. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Sharon. Thank you, Martin, and um, welcome on this Friday lunchtime um, to uh, a talk by me, just me at the moment, um, Sharon Clark. I'm a playwright and dramaturg, and I'm also the creative lead of uh, the company called uh, Raucous. And as Martin said, we are resident at the Pervasive Media Studio here in Bristol. So um, thanks for taking the time to come and sit with me today while I talk about what we've been up to over the last year, the kind of thinking that we've been undertaking and um, some of the explorations and testing that we've been doing. So um, uh, this whole talk is actually PowerPoint led. Um, so you don't have to look at my face for the entire 40 minutes. Um, so uh, here we go. All right. So we're going to be talking today. I've called this talk Building New Narrative Corridors because it's how we started to think about story within the company. Um, A, for our own use that we are starting to think about how we can extend and expand story, but also in response to this current weird time we're going under. So just for those of you who don't know us, this is a very quick statement. Uh, we're an evolving collective of all kinds of artists, technologists, composers, designers, and basically we're just really curious about where theatre could go, the kinds of stories we could tell, the scale we can use, how we can have a deeper uh, relationship with our audience. Um, we're just curious about what the sector might look like over the next 10 years. The first show we made um, was The Stick House in 2015, an immersive piece of theatre using projection mapping, film, music, and digital technology in tunnels under Bristol Temple Mead Station. We tend not to make our work in theatres. We tend to make our work in found spaces, so spaces that may have been unloved in city centres. Our second show was Ice Road in 2017, which was in an old disused Edwardian swimming pool in Hot Wells. Um, and uh, this looked at the siege of Leningrad in 1942. 
And then just before the pandemic hit, we were starting to explore uh, what we are calling Fable, which at the moment is a working title. It was previously called The Undrowned. And we were starting to, uh, the year before last, we did started a series of creative sprints, exploring what that story could be. Uh, we knew we wanted to cite it in a factory or office space somewhere. And we were envisaging it happening uh, at the end of last year. But then, of course, there was a small virus that started to whip its way around the world. And we realized we had to stop and think about what on earth we were going to do next. However, it was sort of a time where we were beginning to think anyway about how we can start to use uh, the internet or augmented reality um, through a um, fellowship I had with the RSC Magic Leap, AR was beginning to start to figure in our creative conversations with our collaborators about if we're interested in taking theater out of theater spaces and into different spaces, then can we push that even harder? So what we decided next was that we would have to pull, obviously, Fable from the end of 2020. We knew it was too risky at the time. So we decided to look at a period of research and development. And we decided to resist the urge to produce, to try to make anything in this brave new world, but rather take the time to sit, think and reflect upon what we've made in the past and what opportunities pandemic may offer us for the future in the way we think about the theatre we like to make. We started with not wanting to lose the impact and the thinking we had done for Fable up to that point. Our collaborators, of which there are many, but there were mainly 10 to 12 of us in this particular uh, creative process, I felt it was really important that we carried on that thinking. We may not make the show this year, but to carry on thinking about it and to have our collaborators, it gives us a longer time to really look at our process. So we started running creative sprints, short, sharp periods of activity, conversation and collaboration around exploring what this show might be through Zoom. Um, and here are some of our lovely collaborators who were making, thinking of the work with us. Everything from spatial sound, AR and AI, through to lighting design, product and experience design, scripting and everything. We all came together for periods of two to three days solid on Zoom, um, trying to work out and think about what this show might look like and how it might affect audiences. We started to really drill down onto inspirations. We always make work that is inspired by uh, an artist whose work we think chimes with the particular show we're making. Uh, we were talking about Andra Couch um, and Tim Walker, um, looking at space and place. We were also looking at Tim Walker's idea of perspective um, and how that might, might work within a space. Uh, our designer, Hannah Wolf, shortly before having her first child with us during lockdown, um, was starting to think about the spaces we might inhabit for this show and how we could dress that space and how we might make it a real true reflection of the world we're trying to build. We also started to look at the period, uh, the character Hope Good Shakespeare. Hope Good Shakespeare is the main character in the fable, it's solo performance. And we started to think about drawing up what that character might look like, how she might move. But what it gave us was a period of reflection on everything we've done in the past and everything we might do in the future. And we decided to just breathe, to just stop and breathe and think about these things. We also even went into lights and lighting references. This is uh, by our lighting designer, Katie, who started to think about what that world might need to feel and look like. We got a bit of money uh, really kindly from the Arts Council. And because we were running Zoom sprints, we began to think about what else we could do in Zoom where we could reach out and talk to other creatives. And one of the ideas we had pre-Zoom was actually a, 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 an initiative we called the Reflectories. 
And what I was interested in is how companies in Great Britain initially could, uh, their artists could swap experiences and processes in a thing called the reflectory where they sat down and they ate together. And then during that, they got to know each other during that meal, they got to know each other and they began to talk about their work with each other and kind of do a, a skill swap. And we suddenly realized that actually through Zoom, we could make this initiative international um, and we could reach out to partners that we were making in Canada and Sweden and start to think about how we might be able to link up artists together to start talking about the pressing need of collaboration in a, a Zoom generation pre post COVID. Um, and so we, um, we, we built three sessions of reflectories that were held online. Um, we had nine partner organizations who helped us identify the artists we might talk to. These partner organizations were in Canada, Wales, England, and Sweden. And they were such places such as the Banff Center, Sherman, Theatre Passamari, and the Hovde University in Sweden. And they were brilliantly generous in sharing with us and sort of brokering relationships between us and 29 artists and participants. We asked that all the participants were of a, a, a really a wide range of age ranges and um, skills uh, and interests and passions. So we had, we had representatives of nearly all of the creative industries and sectors, which was totally amazing. Um, and we asked them all, we gave them a question and a provocation before they uh, came onto Zoom as part of the reflectory. And we also asked them to curate a plate, which means that while we were talking, they would eat something that they felt re reflected their own personalities. So we would sit together, we would talk about the plate, we'd curate it and the food we had on our plate. And then we would go into discussions about what it means to be artists in this weird time. The discussions veered wonderfully between the three different sessions from one of the big things was localism versus globalism. It, we talked about how we pivot as artists. We talked about how we might be able to reach out and make more international relationships with other artists now that we could find them. Um, we talked about recalibrating our process. And the plates were wonderfully diverse. I think from, uh, somebody had lavender on their plate, which was really beautiful. Uh, mead, um, rygost cheese, I hope I've said that, and I'm sorry, it's a smoked cheese from Sweden. We had monster munch, which was my personal favorite from Wales and elk. Um, and these um, uh, talks were live drawn by, um, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. <coughs> uh, by a pervasive media studio artist, Camille Aubry, who um, drew as we went and we could pop into her room and see her drawing. And it was a way of creatively sharing the conversations we had had. Um, and from there, we took several um, quotes that we used that we reflect. I think this is just a sort of six of about 30. We recorded the sessions and also we then put artists in touch with each other so they might be able to collaborate. And then we began to think a bit differently about what fable might be. And we began to think about the fact that actually fable could be the end of a trilogy. Um, and the live performance of fable could actually be preceded by two other um, experiences that started at home, moved into the street, and then moved into performance. Like I said, it's something we've been thinking about for a couple of years anyway. It just made it feel more urgent now that the pandemic is with us. So we wanted to expand the stories we tell. We wanted to build those stories so that they inhabited different spaces and places. The narrative corridors that we were thinking about, that's, that's how we started to come up with that sort of phrase is how can we build narrative corridors in surprising places where theatre may not normally inhabit? How we extend and expand the relationship with our audience? How can we sit with them longer? How can we make the experience more durational? And we, I was really keen though 
that each part of the trilogy would could and would sit alone as its own self-contained story. But actually, if you saw the whole three um, episodes or acts, it would give you a deeper understanding. We wanted to respond to how we might think about making work during and post pandemic. How can we, now that the theatres are such no longer there and we can't be in a space together at the moment, then how can we as theatre makers rethink our practice and our process in order to respond to what is happening around us and the shock of it? And also we wanted to think less about just broadcasting and more about participation. There was a great rush to just broadcast what already was. And that was great. And that really got work out to people and made them feel involved. But then we began to think about actually, how do we respond to it? And how do we take the learning about people are stuck in their houses? How do we make work for that? Not necessarily how do people watch it on their TVs? So chapter one is uh, an at-home experience that we wanted to um, we wanted to explore and through funding with Creative XR, we were really lucky to be given the opportunity to build an initial prototype. It's called The Foundling and I want to show you now a short film because it explains it much better than I can with the, with the joys of PowerPoint and, and me talking at you. So Martin, if you could run that film now, that would be amazing, thank you. <laughs> So The Foundling is an at-home tabletop theatre experience where we use um, objects in order to trigger action so that our characters can climb out of objects that you've built and bring theatre and theatre stories back into your home. So the experience itself, each chapter is around eight to ten minutes long. Uh, there are four chapters and we will release them slowly over several days. What we found really exciting when thinking about the narrative was how we could build a multi-sensory experience and what tools we had at our disposal to do that. So we use everything we possibly could think of, uh, such as starting the experience with SMS text messaging, through smell, through augmented reality, um, through artificial intelligence and especially through um, spatial sound to take you out of your home and immerse you in Hope Good's world. By using chatbots, we allow the audience to talk to any character in the uh, play. However, on this experience, they're talking to uh, a child called Jem as a way of being brought into the theatre world. You might not realise that you're giving the chatbot the kind of um, information that it can use later to make your audience experience feel really personal and like that character actually knows you. There's a reason why this isn't just a virtual reality experience and why we've gone for augmented reality. Um, we're, we're very interested in what the physical components of this experience might be. These materials have a, a quality and properties to them that you couldn't possibly replicate in a virtual world. 48 hours before the experience, you receive a brown paper parcel through the post. On the back of the package in capitals is a stamp. Do not open until the clock strikes seven. An hour before the experience, you receive another message. And at 7 p.m. the experience starts. You put your headphones in and you open the package. As you open the package, you begin to hear music. Inside, you find an envelope and a flat object wrapped in cloth. On the objects are instructions from Hopegood. The flattened object is a map of the marshes and the platform for the world. It smells of damp, wet marshland. And then, with a swish of her skirts, Hopegood Shakespeare enters your room. You are once one of the babies she nursed and, as she is to be hung in the morning for murder, she is desperate to tell you your story before it's lost forever. You came. Do you know? I knew you would. 
We have a long way to go, you and me. So, why don't we start by opening that envelope? Yeah, Hope Good Shakespeare as a character is a kind of real delicious sort of meld of fact and fiction. So I'm, I'm really interested in the role of uh, the foundling hospital in the late 18th century, where children whose mothers unfortunately couldn't afford to keep them would lay them down on the step every morning. And I began to think about those women who had to wet nurse, those children. What if that wet nurse was a foundling herself? She has your story. She keeps it like a treasure close to her heart. And at this particular moment in the story, she's coming back to find you, to tell you who you are. You're then invited to open the envelope. Inside is a globe. It smells too. It's infused with smells of warm milk and nutmeg, triggering memories of childhood. You then place the globe in the map and illuminate the physical world. The globe is a, f a found material, it's a Bible, um, which we feel is one of those materials that you can find anywhere. So Hope Good, in her world, could have just ripped a page out of the Bible and made this, this globe out of it. Now, come on, you remember me. Hope Good. You came to me after your ma left you on the orphanage steps and disappeared into the fog, never to be seen again. You came into my arms, bawling like a board and looking like a skinned rabbit. <laughs> Inside your swaddling, I found a hazelnut. On it, your poor wretched ma had scratched your initials. It's all she left of you. And you know, the pity of it is, no one knows what those initials stand for. Hope Good lives in the Essex marshes, which are a dangerous and dark place. And we want to take you there. She comes into your home, takes you by the hand and walks you through the marshes to her house, where she starts to tell you her story, where she's come from, but also at the same time giving you clues as to where you come from. I've lived on these marshes as long as I can remember. Vile and cruel and bitter to some, but home to the likes of us. I arrived here on the back of William Sevenoaks' cart because, like you, I'd been discarded by a mother who couldn't see no future in me and a pa who had skedaddled or died or been taken by the Navy. The way that we conceive the AR is that it would slowly bring you into the world. The marsh landscape is a landscape where Hope Good lives, but also a reflection of the physical nature of Hope Good. It's made out of textures of hair. You travel across the uh, marsh landscape and we make this uh, illusion through only revealing part of the, la the marsh landscape at one time. So you travel across it to Hope Good's house uh, and, and then at that point you're invited to come into Hope Good's house which is a very personal space. Each of the four chapters of The Foundling brings a new parcel and a new object that triggers that chapter's story. When arranged and viewed in a certain way, they reveal a secret about your history and your life with Hope Good. At the end of the fourth chapter, or the fourth episode, is when you suddenly realise exactly what danger she's in and that you really have to meet her in the flesh. You really have to go to her so she can look you in the eye and tell you where you come from. And that's where you then lead into the live experience, where you'll meet her face to face for the first time. I will find you again. I have such little time to tell you your story. Because soon, we will be here and... We often talk at Raucous about awe and wonder, 
how we can take our audiences on a narrative journey that instills in them those feelings. And with the foundling, that is particularly pertinent, is we want them to feel that they have been transported to another place, that they are being talked to by a character who shouldn't exist in their own home, and that they feel the storytelling is really personal to them. They should feel like we as theatre makers are whispering directly into their ear and showing them things they've never seen before. Thanks. Hi, welcome back. Um, so that was chapter one that we were thinking of and, and, and we've got the prototype for that and we are just looking now at this year at, um, at putting that into production in some way or other. We're just trying to figure out the roots. Um, and then chapter two is um, we were thinking about the narrative space of the journeying to the actual theatre. So what would happen if the story came out to meet you. So out of the performance space of the final part of this trilogy, if it came out and instead of you turning up to the doors of a space to see the show, you actually turned up to a place such as, I don't know, a statue or a park or a street corner. And then the story picked you up from there and took you, escorted you into the performance space. So the second part of the trilogy we're calling Athona which is our um, protagonist, Hope Good, lives on the Essex marshes. Um, and we wanted to bring the Essex marshes out of the performance space, pick you up and take you through. And we were wondering how we do that. How do we navigate through, say, an urban landscape to take you into the performance space? So one of the things that we have been thinking of is curating that journey to the space, transforming the landscape, building what we call a narrative port cochere, which is something that comes out of the building that you shelter under before you enter into. We were also thinking that the audience could bring the weather that we build in that space with them so that they bring the environment we've built outside inside. Uh, we thought it would help really knit together that um, audience as a community before they've even gone into the immersive life space. We would lean into animating objects, which is something we're known for. We're known for our familiars. Um, and we will want to lean into that more by having an object that they carry with them that actually carries the experience for them. Um, we were thinking about turning how we could turn the audience into an installation in the street with original music before they've got to the performance space. And then that experience would have two audiences because the audience themselves journeying to the space would become an installation and could be then viewed by passers-by. So what we came up with, this actually is an hours, is what we've come up with is the idea is that everybody is given uh, an umbrella. And that umbrella forms a sort of performance pot through which we can, through projection mapping, turn the urban landscape into a stormy night on the Essex marshes. With spatial sounds, we can have you hearing children running up behind you and hope good as a siren calling you to the performance space so she can start to tell you her story. Um, and we uh, were looking around and, and brilliantly uh, Pervasive Media Studio came up with a project very similar, but that is much more about installation at uh, Zurich University of the Arts. We've reached out to them, to Eric, and we are both, uh, Eric and ourselves and Eric's company, are now looking at how we could learn from each other about our work with projection mapping and umbrellas. His work is much more about people affecting the space. Our work is much more about how we deliver narrative through umbrellas that um, incorporate smell when you open them and haptics when lightning strikes the umbrella. So we're looking at sort of digital placemaking and changing that journey to the audience, uh, into the performance space, reaching out to you and you taking it in with you. And then, therefore the third chapter is actually an immersive experience itself. At the moment that third part is called Fable, that's just our working title. Um, and it is, uh, our raucous show, our third raucous show. So you will go into the space, 
uh, and meet Hope Good Shakespeare for the first time. You may have seen her as a, 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 an AR figure in the at-home experience of the foundling. Then you may hear her in the more spatial sound installation of the street. And now finally in this part, you will meet her face to face. It's a solo performance. It's the culmination of the story of Hope Good Shakespeare. It uses a language called Kant, which is 19th century language used by thieves and those on the outside of normal society or polite society, I should say. You, it's revealed to you what your role in our history has been all this time. Uh, we want to cite it in somewhere that has some space, such as an old factory or warehouse. It will be housed in four large white nightdresses that will raise and move and morph to provide different spaces for the audience and the actor to explore. It will use um, all uh, live experience and live performance. It's immersive projection mapping. We worked with Ardman on our last show around animation, original score, haptics, smell, and object-based media, which are our, our familiars. And it will also be Raucus's first touring production. We're in talks at the moment with um, Canada and cities in England to take it out on our first ever tour. So we then began to think, well, if we're making the Endrown trilogy and we're talking about narrative in different spaces and places, why isn't that reflected in our marketing? Why aren't we thinking about how we can make our marketing more immersive or surprising? Or how our marketing can reflect more the kind of work we make rather than it just being a flat leaflet or a poster that's very static on a wall. Why, if our shows aren't 2D, is our marketing 2D? So we have been really fortunate the last three years to have some amazing organizations back us, back our risk taking and back our ideas. And um, uh, one of them is Swakton Southwest Creative Technology Network. Um, uh, and the other one is uh, Bristol and Bath Creative Clusters who uh, gave our head of uh, audiences and communication, Claire, a fellowship to look at how we could use augmented reality to animate posters. So the dream would be, or the idea is, that you go into Bristol Temple Maid Station, into the underpass, there is a big poster for Fable or for the Andram trilogy itself, and you can, it will trigger your phone to say that you have content waiting for you. You put your phone up to it and hope good Shakespeare steps out. That we animate and make dy dynamic decisions about our marketing, but we start story in the marketing before you've even bought a ticket. So Claire has been um, amazing in working at looking at how we can, first of all, because of the pandemic, we've had to move all that into leaflets and how we can audience test sending leaflets through doors to people's homes so that they can try it at home. And the idea is it all springs from the hazelnut that you heard about in the foundling is that it is a piece of card with just a hazelnut on, but when you put your phone over it, the hazelnut cracks open and out of it starts to spill, start of our story. We couldn't have thought or made any of this work without these incredible friends, colleagues, peers and partners. Some have given us money to, <laughs> to explore what feels like sometimes just, I don't know, mad ideas around story and audiences. Some have lent us an ear, some have mentored us and spoken at length with us. Some have just gone, yeah, we'll come on the journey with you and see where it goes. This isn't an exhaustive list and I apologize if I've left anybody out, but these, this is the kind of range of people we have had to work with in order to try to make all of this work move on to the next level. We don't know where it's going to lead. We know it's all tricky, we know. But this is the kind of vision that has formed during pandemic that we'd really like to carry on exploring. We might not be the ones to make this happen. We probably won't, but we need ambition in order to answer what's happening to us right now, I believe. And we need to use this time to really dream about what might be possible 
we might never get the money we need to make these things. We might not have the right skills or it might not be the right time to make these things. But I think as artists, it's really important that we at least put our curiosity and energy into trying them out. I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you for joining me. And um, Martin now I know will chair any questions that might have come up in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was fantastic. And yeah, lots of great comments coming through. Everyone very, very impressed with the, the sound work in that video, uh, apparently. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that the sound work is by, um, is uh, Helen Sciera who um, uh, worked on the encounter with uh, Theatre Complicite. She's amazing. Great, thanks. So, um, yeah, still waiting on some questions to come through from the chat, so everybody please get them in. I'm going to kick things off with a question of my own. Um, you, you do a lot of work where you sort of, you use technology to make sort of slightly magical effects happen. How do you uh, make it so that that audiences aren't distracted by trying to figure out how it works and are, and get still pay attention to the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, I mean, it's a really big consideration, all those things about, um, I don't know uh, if you remember where in Stickhouse we had dolls and um, there were only a couple of instances I was quite surprised where we had nude dolls returned. I People had actually undressed the dolls to see how they operated or occasionally broken them in two. I mean, what we try to do is keep the narrative moving very fast so that you have to pay attention to where the narrative is going in order to understand where the objects, what role the objects take place in it. I mean, for the, for the um, Soviet radios in Ice Road, um, if you'd have taken them apart, you'd have just found doorbells in there which was amazing considering that means that was all that heavy lifting was done by software by the amazing uh, Timothy X. A. Tacker's composer and um, Tom Metcalf. Um, so we're very lucky that we don't get much of it. We get people pressing things and trying things. Everybody thinks it's, it should be terribly interactive. Um, whereas we're not really big on interaction, we're more big on sort of guiding you through an experience. Um, but for us, it's trying to keep the narrative flowing and the live action flowing so that actually you hopefully don't have chance to kind of wander off and go, well, what's this and how do I make it work? I hope. Yeah. And so following on from that, we got a question here from uh, Simone Einfalt. Uh, how satisfied are you with the AR content tying into the more tangible and physical elements of the experience? <sighs> At the moment, totally dissatisfied i'm on it i'm going to be honest because we have to be but we're in early 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 days we're in dreaming stage right now and we all know from this month to next month tech just zips and changes you know what magic leap was doing with ar before they discovered that wasn't going to work for them right at that time and place um, was extraordinary, I think, as a theatre maker. And I, I'm not a huge, by the way, I'm not a huge, I don't know much about tech. Um, I have a, a fantastic collaborative network where people are experts in that field. Um, but what Magic Leap was, was capable of doing with physical objects was extraordinary. Um, that went by the by creatively, but I think a new generation will obviously sweep in and we all know that's coming, it's sweeping in. I think give it another couple of years and I will be a lot more satisfied. We have to sometimes, talking to colleagues who work in this, I have these big ideas and my collaborators go, lower your vision, mate. Just, <laughs> you know, it's just like lovely. You want to do all that shit over there, but you've got to lower your vision a bit. Um, and I think what we do is we start off with this really big, colorful idea and then we realize we have to manage it to expectation because it's not always going to work we have to simplify everything and at the moment we're at with the foundling the film you saw we're at that point of going actually it's this big and it's lovely but we actually probably need to be this big for now and we're trying to be uber realistic after a moment of going 
how, what, what it could be. So um, I kind of see it's going from sort of jazz hands to kind of like what's in this matchbox. Um, and that's part of the process and that's okay. It's really okay. One day I will make that big show the way I want to do it, but for now I can't, it's fine. So Melissa Blackburn asks, uh, you said that you might not be the people to make this work. Uh, can you expand on that? Uh, she thinks you might be the people. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa, you're so kind. I think looking back over the world of immersion and this kind of work, whatever this kind of work is, I'm sorry, I don't even know what that means, transdisciplinary, it's got so many titles, doesn't it? But just making stories with different tools, I think is you will normally get somebody who sort of comes out the starting gate and does some experiments and, and then somebody comes along and takes what they've learned and is better at it and makes something bigger and shinier and bolder. And then somebody takes, it's, it's, it's a relay race. It's like a baton thing, isn't it? They take the baton moves on. And I I think we'll go so far. I, you know, that sounds like I'm doing this down. We're brilliant. And, and I know my colleagues are amazing, but I'm just trying, this is a talk about process and, and things. And so I, you know, we could be the ones to make that work, but also there are these amazing brains coming up and coming through who think about it differently to us. And where we might have got into a mindset of doing it this way, somebody wonderful over there is going to go, no, we're going to do it this way. So, so I never think we will always have the answers. I think we'll always have the questions. And I think that's really exciting. Um, but I absolutely expect somebody else somewhere to find that vision I've always, that we'd always wanted and make it their own. Right. It's, what, it's the nature of innovation. It has to work that way. Absolutely. Um, so Mitch Turnbull asks, uh, I'm intrigued by the spatial sound. You and Helen nailed it 1000%. Uh, what was the process for that? Um, I don't understand these things, but it was, I thought it was easier than I ever dreamt it would be. <laughs> Helen might not say that. Um, uh, Sennheiser really beautifully and generously, and they weren't on that list. And I apologize, I've suddenly realized um, lent us a, a binaural head, um, amazing, amazing organization who back artists so, so brilliantly. And then, um, and it was in lockdown, so we were all masked. And then Helen and I were in a studio with it and actors, and we just had the day of almost directing the whole experience. Um, and um, Helen would shout at me through her mask and a window, and then we would go and do it again. And I was directing in the space as we went with them. So it was an incredibly much more creative experience, to be honest. I've not, I haven't worked with such a great spatial sound designer as that. Um, it was much more creative than I thought it was going to be. And we did a lot of that stuff on the hoof. And also that was just one day. And Helen was like, well, it's a draft. It, you know, it, it will show people what we could do if we, we had time. Um, she, she is extraordinary. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it was easier than I thought, Mitch, to be honest, because Helen is brilliant. Good. Yeah, always great to work with good people. Oh, my God, yes. Oh, my God, they're, they're amazing and nice. Never work with people who are not nice. It's not worth it. Sure. Uh, Camille Aubrey asks, uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about digital poverty and how theatre makers can make sure that all audiences have access to expanded performance. Yeah, Camille, hello, lovely. Um, I'm sorry, I'm thinking. That's my thinking face, everybody. Because it's conversations we have a lot. Um, and it, it's hard. It's why, sorry, I keep starting sentences. I'm, my head's just going, Whoa. it's why I'm interested in augmented reality with phones and I know not everybody can afford phones either but a lot more people have phones than for instance oculus rift so it's why I'm interested in tech that people have access to we're not we are not going to be able in an ideal world I would love the work to be accessible to absolutely everybody attitudinally uh, electronically technically 
space wise everything of course we we try really hard and that's also why we make our work in kind of found spaces too is is attitudinally so that people go i'm not going to theater i'm going to see this experience and it doesn't put them off that's one of the main reasons why we do that um and i think the things around tech is is choosing the tools correctly or as best as you can to make it as accessible as possible um, I mean, I was at a, um, I was invited to a VR meeting uh, and as part of Creative XR and, and they won't mind me saying this because I fed it back to them that I was, in, and they said, you know, come to this VR meeting, we'll all meet. And I tried to say, I don't, I, I, I'm in lockdown. I don't own a VR headset. I just don't have one. They were quite surprised because I work in tech. So perhaps I should have had one, but it was like, well, no, it's not a, it's, it's not a priority for me. So that, that there's never going to be a perfect answer for it. I don't think it's ever going to be a perfect time for it. But we we all are charged with thinking really hard about how we can make it as accessible as possible, which is why I'm so interested in mobile technology and AR rather than £3,000 uh, glasses. Or it, it, is, it is trying to introduce it into the home. I hope that, it, I hope that explains it, Camille. Sorry, I can't be any more concrete. Great. Uh, so Ruth Bennett um, has a sort of comment question. Uh, I think people expect interactivity because of their experience with AR and the technology is via gaming. And as gaming d delves more deeply into narrative, it seems like theatre and gaming are reaching towards each other. Uh, do you consider the boundaries of each of those areas, theatre and gamification? And are you moving towards that or away from that? Uh, it's a really great question because it's something else we talk about and I've spouted a bit, I've spouted my mouth off a bit before the, about this before now and I've got to be careful. Um, yes, gaming and theatre are sniffing around each other, looking, going on first dates, seeing what that looks like, seeing if their horoscopes align. And that is amazing because you're right, what gaming is doing with narrative right now is phenomenal and it's just totally mind blowing and theater we have to listen to that we have to look at that and go blimey the you know the gaming industry the games industry is just phenomenal at narrative now and but also no and, and i also thought games was about you know shoot 'em ups or doom or um you know the most beautiful gentle stuff i've seen and witnessed because i've never i i'd never played a game before last year um, because I'm not of that generation that grew up with them. So we are looking at each other. I personally, as, an, as myself and the company, is our interactivity for me and an audience isn't my priority right now. And the reason is I am trying to introduce a theatre audience to the possibilities of new theatre tools for them. So uh, through the use of a new, a larger toolbox that digital technology can give me, AR or whatever, AI, whatever I can use, I want to use, if it's right for the story. Um, so I am trying to get them to look at what the sector could be over the next 10, 15 years, how it can evolve. And to do that, I don't want to frighten the horses too much. Um, I, I, I myself struggle with interactivity in a live environment where other people are looking at me and maybe judging me. Maybe I'll break it. Maybe I'll look a fool. Maybe I'll. So although the industry, the, the product is, is looking at each other, games and theatre, at the moment, the audiences are still quite a way away from each other. They're coming together closer, but they're still, you know, those in games will know to be really interactive. What's this? What's that? How do I open this? Let me look at that. I look down here, go here, go there. Theatre audiences are expecting, used to expect to be very stationary and static and have everything transmitted to them. So it's finding a wonderful kind of hinterland between those two things where everybody gets a bit of what they want. We had a, um, in the stick house, we had a massive table um it was huge it was, it was it was about five foot high the, the chairs were like nine foot high and and uh, we projected down onto it uh, a scene and i you could see the people who used interactive games because they were running around the table trying to press it to see if it did something or trying to find triggers they were sitting in the chairs they were sitting on the tables 
the ushers were like, oh my God, I don't want to. But it was really interesting about that level of freedom to interact. And if you're like a punch drunk audience member, you are used to being invited to go and do this and do that. Um, I'm really excited where games and theatre are coming together. Um, I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see some extraordinary things come out of it. And I think as Raucous evolves and grows and sees those things, then interaction will become much more a thought as we're going through building story. Does that make sense? I think that made a lot of sense. Uh, we've got time for one or two more questions if anyone wants to get them in. But I wanted to follow up on what you just said. And what do you think the advantages and disadvantages are of framing what you're doing as theatre? Uh, yeah, well done. That's, that is so we talk about it all the time. What is it we do? I don't know. It's a bit of this. It's a bit of a, an old mongrel, really, I feel. Um, we, in our first show, we didn't use the word immersion or immersive theatre. We didn't use those words because I just thought it would put a lot of people off. People came to see the show and then everybody afterwards was saying to me, oh, it's immersive. It's an immersive show. It's like, okay, all right, you're owning the label as the audience. We will use the label. Um, but we talk less and less and less about theatre. Um, we tend to talk about experience. We tend to talk about lots of different disciplines. We tend to talk about story more. So we lead with story now every time. And how you get that story doesn't really matter. I'm asking you to turn up to this place at this time and you'll be told a story and just come and, and keep an open mind about how it might be given to you. But I think uh, these labels are all blurring into each other and they are becoming this fantastic jelly of, of disciplines and forms. Um, and to give it an overall name really limits it, I think. So uh, talking to Claire Scousey, who's our, uh, our, our you know, guru around communication, is talking, you still have to talk about theatre sometimes because that's the audience you've got for talks like this. It's like, you know, how are we going to change theatre? And that's when I have to do it. But to our audiences, we talk less and less and less about it and we talk more and more and more about the characters and the story. And we might say that the tools we use, so we might go, you know, we use a bit of film, we use some music, we use to give them a bit of a better flavour. But, you know, I, I'm trying not to put it in a box and put too many people off. Mm. So it, it, isn't it asking quite a lot of trust from your audience to say, oh, just turn up at this place and we'll, we'll tell you a story? Yeah, it is asking quite a bit of trust. Um, I mean, there are there are different ways there are different levels of marketing that you use, you know, that obviously we don't use the same message for everything and every time and everybody. Um, but I'm hoping that if the story sounds intriguing enough and we talk about the experience as something that is we are never use the word joyful, but that we we imbue it with a sense of joy, joy or wonder or awe is that they might just trust us enough to go, well, I'm going to go and see something that's slightly different. I don't know if I've got a name for it, but it sounds like it could be fun. Great, thank you. And I, I guess as one final question, when are we going to get to see this? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the way we're all going. Probably, I don't know, 2030. No, um, we are hoping to do to, to, to make something by the end of this year, which part of that we don't know. Um, but the, uh, the uh, fable, the final, the final piece, we are hoping for November 2022. Obviously, everything is being put back because we have no certainty about the future. So uh, we are working towards that. And then in the meantime, we're hoping to either make chapters one or two or a version of chapters one and two. So we've got just under two years to, to, to carry on with the thinking and, and try and get it right. Great, looking forward to it. Thank uh, you. I think that's about all we got time for today. So thank you very much, Sharon. Um, before you all go, next week's talk is by Alice Quigley, Editor-in-Chief of Container Magazine, a new online magazine about creative technology. 
She'll be talking about her approach to tech, about raising up different voices that question, dissent and explore, and about supporting communities of action and resistance through writing and content. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share the link. Captioned version of this video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you here again next week.